This is the CRE Weekly Digest by Lightbox, a firm transforming the commercial real estate landscape by connecting every step of the CRE process with comprehensive tools and data. I'm Martha Kocher with Manis Clancy and Diane Crocker. This is a special guest podcast covering the CRE Capital Markets. Our guest, Brian Olasov, is the Executive Director at Carlton Fields and an adjunct professor at NYU Shack Institute of Real Estate Capital Markets. He's a longtime friend of the Real Estate Investment Advisory Council, known as REAC. He's also the 2024 recipient of the Crefsey Founders Award for his contributions to the commercial real estate finance industry, spanning more than three decades. He has an extensive business and capital markets expertise across troubled mortgage loans, banking challenges, and he's often called as an expert testimony witness to Congress on many of these topics. So we have a lot of things we've got to ask you, Brian. I'm excited to get at it. Great. So let's start with something that you spoke at REACT's 20th annual debt capital markets presentation. You said something interesting that we're not exactly in blue sky territory at the moment. And further, you've said that economists have gotten forecasts catastrophically wrong for the last several years. Can you give us a sense of where we stand today? Yeah, the point that I was trying to convey is that I actually consider the most boring times to be when everyone in the market is in agreement. And when I talk about blue skies, I know that particularly under zero interest rate policy for the last few years up to March 2022, when the Fed started ratcheting rates, everyone was partying, lenders, borrowers, terms were getting stretched, leverage was being increased. We're in a completely different world right now. These are the markets where expertise really supports better outcomes, as opposed to being order takers, which is where we were in 22, 23. In terms of uh, what The Economist have been talking about, and I think I mentioned yesterday's Wall Street Journal had a piece by James McIntosh talking about all of the economic rules of thumb, none of which have proven to be correct. And they talked about the Phillips curve, which is the relationship between inflation and unemployment. They talked about the yield curve inversion, which we're just stepping out of after a very, very prolonged period of having an inverted yield curve. Uh, and if you roll the clock back to the annual survey that the Wall Street Journal conducts at year end and take a look at what they were, uh, the 100 nationally ranked economists were predicting for 2023, 100 out of 100 economists predicted a recession. We're the envy of the industrialized world. Our GDP is running at 3.2 percent. Uh, inflation is coming under control. So my point is that you just need to be very, very cautious about not only conventional wisdom, but even, even what the experts are saying. And this is particularly true in real estate, where you have lots of different contrary indicators. So in terms of where we are in the market, I work for a law firm. I'm not a lawyer, so you would expect me to take an equivocal position, and I'll do so. It, it depends. You, you cannot generalize. You can't generalize by geography. You can't generalize by property type. And the one thing that I know for sure is that this is a time that any averages, market averages, are extraordinarily misleading. And we talked about this a little bit yesterday as well, the, the old joke about as soon as Bill Gates walks into a bar, the average net worth of everyone in the bar is a billion dollars. That doesn't mean that anything has changed with respect to the other hundred people in the bar. So... When you're in a market like we've got today with wildly disparate outcomes at a property level, it's very, very misleading to talk about average performance, average performance in retail, average performance in multifamily. This is a time that the experts need to be extraordinarily discriminating at the property level and the submarket level. I want to go back to the top, just because I don't want to lose sight of this before I go to my first question, and that is... When we went through Brian's resume before, and they talked about his 30-year contribution to the CMBS market, I got to say that for those that don't know, the people that were leaning into the CMBS market 30 years ago, helping build the standards, helping build the rules, the information reporting packages, and so forth, that was real heavy lifting, right? Sometimes that gets lost on people that are new to the industry. So... I didn't want to brush through that, that uh, Brian's contributions were real, 
they involved leaning in and the market wouldn't have taken off in the way that it did starting in the mid nineties without guys like Brian really taking the time to sweat the details about all the different calculations that had to go into this. And the market certainly was better because of that. But let me get into my first question, Brian, for you. And it it is one that compares the period after the great financial crisis to today. After the great financial crisis, the people that did extraordinarily well were some of the contrarians. They were people that were willing to put money to risk long before anybody could see any green shoots when people thought that the economy was still collapsing. And the people that did take that leap really saw outsized gains. How can you contrast the period we're in now to back then? Is there an opportunity now for people to make those same kind of gains? Or is it much more diverse in terms of the geography you talk about, the property type? Give us a sense of how they compare and contrast. Well, first of all, I I appreciate your comments. I, I really do feel in some ways that I was president of the creation and not not to not to humble brag about it, but it's because we made every conceivable mistake coming out of out of the thrift crisis that we finally stumbled upon the truth. We had three years where we were really grasping at straws, not understanding how to clear the market, and then ultimately the market taught us taught us modesty and taught us humility in what in what to expect. The point that you're making about the GFC. It's, it's not idle speculation. Uh, everyone on the call runs on data. If you take a look at the handful of deals, CMBS deals, I'm using CMBS as a proxy for the overall commercial real estate debt market because we have the data. We don't have analogous data on banks or life insurance companies. But if you take a look at CMBS, vintage 2010 and certainly 2011 when the market started regaining its speed in 2012, Those deals, you can take a look at the delinquency and the default curves and loss severities experienced in those early pools coming out of the great financial crisis, where it really did take significant intestinal fortitude to convince your investment committee to to buy bonds or to make the loans, originate the loans in the first place. One of the, the data points that I think has been lost as we look at the previous cycles is that when you date the the end of the recession of the great financial crisis, the end point, according to NBER, is June 2009. We didn't, uh, uh, and Mandis, I know I know that you know this data better than I do, delinquency didn't hit bottom until May 2012. So it took three years after the recession, that talks to the lag in commercial real estate debt and projects, It took a solid three years after the great financial crisis recession for the commercial real estate market to bottom out. So that makes even more courageous those people who are stepping up to originate and invest in commercial real estate generally and debt products in particular. But they've been rewarded over time with outsized rewards. What you say about the GFC is is generally true coming out of the bottom of every real estate recession. You can go back to the to the early 80s when Volcker raised prime up to 21.5% and what that did to real estate markets and even earlier back in the, in the 70s after the oil shock. At the bottom of every crisis is the time to start lending if you have patient capital. And to me, it's paradoxical. This actually came up on a couple of panels that I moderated with, with bankers. And I love bankers. I was a banker. I'm married to a banker. My friends are bankers. But the paradox that I presented on the panel is, why is it that when spreads get to inside plus 100 to the treasury curve, leverage blows out, lenders have no leverage over the borrowers, financial conditions are loose, covenants are thrown out the window. Why do you load the boat on loans at that point? And then contrast to where we are today or you know a couple of months ago where it's a lender's market the lenders have the leverage borrowers are scrambling lenders are are price givers borrowers are price takers spreads are are two times three times wider than they were back in 2022 2023 and now is the time that banks put up their their close for business signs that to me has never made any sense. It's a it's a it's a contrarian buy high sell low strategy. 
and it wrecks banks every time. I understand that banks are heavily regulated. I understand that there are going to be banks, particularly smaller banks with small capital cushions that have concentration limits that have been breached. In that case, the bank doesn't really have the discretion to lend. The regulators are essentially saying, you're done. You need to lighten up your CRE exposure. But that's the, that's the vast minority of banks. Most banks can choose to, to lend, and right now, they're either choosing not to lend or they're, they're dipping their toes very gently back into the CRE pool. I think that's a mistake. Now's the time to make great, durable loans under very attractive terms. What does the, let's call it the clogging of the arteries, the fact that banks are not lending right now, what is that doing to distress to the markets down the, the road, people trying to get out of situations where either on a run rate basis, they're underwater or they're facing a refinancing challenge? What does the bank's reticence right now mean to the market in real time for, for somebody like you and what you're seeing? So if we roll the clock back, I always look at, at prior downturns to figure out what, what kind of analogies we can draw. And I remember very well in 2016 that we were looking on the wall of maturities. Uh, that was the boogeyman of the time, the wall of maturities, because 2007, you remember, the market exploded, $230 billion worth of uh, U.S. domestic CMBS issuance, and all that 10-year stuff was coming due. And I know all the special servicers very well. I do a lot of expert witness for the masters and the special servicers. And I started talking to them about whether they were, in fact, hitting a wall where they were running into maturity defaults. And what I heard from all the special servicers back in 2016 and into early 2017 was surprising. And they, they were telling me that almost independent of debt yield, the debt yield could be 10 or 11%, which obviously could clear the market, should be able to clear the market. A lot of the debt yields that were being refinanced out were at 6% debt yields, which should not have been refinanceable, and yet they were being refinanced. The inevitable next question is, who the heck are you getting wire transfer funds from to take out that ballooning mortgage loan? And inevitably, inevitably, they would describe a bank somewhere in the Midwest that they had never heard of before, okay? I, I said the Midwest, but around the country, community banks, small regional banks that no one had ever heard of before. So the white knight back in the wall of maturities in 2017 reduced it to what I called at the time, not the wall of maturities, but the white picket fence of maturities. We just walked right over it. There was no problem refinancing all of that because we had these less rigorous lenders who were able to take us out. Now, fast forward to where we are right now. And, and depending on which data set you look at, MBA knows different numbers than I do, reasons that we can, we can talk about. But in rough, in rough numbers, it's about a trillion dollars a year coming due. And the default resolution is typically extend. Give someone an extra 12 months, an extra 24 months. So now you have a new phenomenon that's been labeled the snow plowing effect. So 2023's maturities got pushed into 2024, and those are rolling into 2025. So the, the number is not managing itself down. It's not self-liquidating. It's growing. And in this case, we don't have a white knight in the form of commercial banks that are going to step up and make what I would argue are diseconomic refinancing decisions. So this is something that the market is going to have to work itself out of over time. There's still a lot more for the lag reasons that we talked about a couple of minutes ago. There's a lot more pain to go. The default rate and the delinquency rate is still going up. Loss severities over the last 12 months are pushing 65%. And we're going to see a lot more pain before all of this clears out on the legacy side. I did have the good fortune of hearing your panel in Atlanta. If any of our listeners have a chance to hear Brian in person, I strongly encourage you to clear your calendars. You're a good agent. <laughs> you get 10% you get of my speaker's fees. Now, listen, I, I want to ask you about the snowplow effect. And I, I will confess that was the first time that I heard that term. It's now the new term, it seems, for kicking the can down the road, which we used in the 
the previous downturn. You know, I, I think those delays in making decisions about loan maturities, I think, have have really frustrated opportunistic investors who thought certainly that they would have more loans to shop and distressed assets to look at than they certainly have thus far. We are hearing from Lightbox's clients on the environmental due diligence side that they're just now starting to see an uptick in refi work and a small amount of foreclosure projects just in the third quarter for the first time this year. And I'm wondering, just to kind of continue the point that you just made, do you do you see these loan maturities and eventual distress kind of working their way through the market as, you know, a deluge at some point when the day of reckoning arrives or like kind of a slow trickle over the next few years? So it's a great question. And I know a lot of those opportunistic investors. I think we I think we pejoratively called them vulture investors and during the last downturn. But the opportunistic investors have so much investable capital ready to go that the, the, the few times that uh, loan sales do come on the market, it turns into a bit of a feeding frenzy, particularly when you're dealing with portfolios. What you're describing really depends on the, the nature of the financing source. The one thing that I've learned over time, and I love doing panels where you have a life insurance company and a commercial banker and capital markets guy and a private equity guy, maybe a mortgage rate lender, because I think what the audience comes to understand is the way that these individual lenders contend with these problems are completely different. They're completely different. We know, uh, rolling the clock back again to the RTC days, the Resolution Trust Corporation was set up, Manus was just talking about this in 1989, to deal with 700 failed lending institutions, $410 billion worth of real estate stuff, debt, equity, construction, you know, a little bit of everything. And when the market found its footing and there was a very significant secondary market in trading those loans and REO, then the private market followed. And the, the very early adopters among the commercial banks that accessed the market and sold portfolios of their non-performing loans figured out something. The market actually greeted the sale of the non-performing loans, even if you sold at 50 cents on the dollar, 40 cents on the dollar. The fact that you were clearing the books, the stock market on those public banks always rose and it usually popped. And that lesson was not lost on all the other bankers. So all the other bankers assumed a herd mentality and they all started doing a clearance on their non-performing loans. That's why the market was able to reestablish itself so quickly by 1995. The market had cleared itself. And Manus used the term congestion. I use a, uh, an earthier term. I talk about when you, when you have heavy non-performing loans in the system, and the system is frozen. We aren't there now, but we certainly were a year ago. I talk about this, the market being constipated. And you need something, you need X lax in that situation. And the ability to bring loans to market does so many beneficial things. Most of the financing sources are in the recycling business. Commercial banks can't lend right now for a lot of different reasons. But one of the reasons is that if they're making three-year floating rate loans, they expect a third of their book to be paid off every year. When that three-year loan becomes a five-year loan, guess what? Not only are they under regulatory pressure, not only does their concentration go up, but they don't have the opportunity to recycle those refi dollars back into new loan originations. But the other good thing that comes out of cleaning up your portfolio is that it brings price discovery to the market. That's been one of the, the major challenges in today's market. And you go talk to my friends at the appraisal shops off record, they kind of shrug their shoulders. If we don't have comparable transactions, we don't know what the cap rate is on a CBD office building. We don't know where to, we, we don't know where to look to get the numbers that we need to in order to model out to do a DCF. Certainly in the case of office, and I don't know that we need to talk about office, it's its own special purgatory. But in the case of, of doing a valuation on an office building, certainly a year ago, you didn't know what your lease structure was going to be once your leases rolled over. 
You didn't know what your operating expenses were going to be. Therefore, you didn't know what your NOI was going to be. And on top of that, even if you did have those other variables, you don't know the cap rate to apply to it. So you're trying to solve for four variables with no information. It's impossible. You can't, you can't do valuation in that kind of environment. And that's another plug to the system, which really jammed up any kind of lending opportunities in the system. CMBS is different. Capital markets are different. When you take a look at the, at the document that governs the management of a pool of commercial mortgage uh, loans, the master servicer and the special servicer, they certainly can apply reasonable business judgment, but if in their reasonable business judgment, the best thing they can do is foreclose the property and sell it off as REO or to sell the note or to modify or somehow resolve it, they really don't have the luxury of, of simply sitting on non-performing loans. They have to do something. Their investors demand it and they have to report on it and they need to show their homework and how they came up with those resolution strategies. It's doing workouts in a, in a fishbowl as opposed to a, a regulated financial institution that really does it behind, behind a cloak, except for the regulators. Brian, you talked a little bit about bank behavior, how they pull back during rockier times, and in addition, how they don't have this churn of loans coming due to redeploy. You talked about the CMBS market, but parenthetically, a few minutes ago, you brought up private equity. They weren't around at the advent of CMBS. They weren't around during the great financial crisis, but they became a big engine of lending in 2020, 2021, 2022 often floating rate. Uh, it seems like you can tie a lot of the distress right now to buyers that bought at the peak of the market using floating rate debt. Any signs as to their behavior thus far and how their either willingness to put loans out for sale or not is influencing the market in ways that we didn't see 10 years ago? It's a great point. And I would say that just like there are 4,500 commercial banks in the country, and they all engage in slightly different lending behavior. A lot of the private equity groups are contending with their legacy problems in different ways. All of the private equity companies that I know that were doing exactly what you're talking about uh, and putting out floating rate money during the time of zero interest rate policy when cap rates were at ridiculous levels. Now that they're coming due, that most of that is two, two or three or floating rate paper at the time it would have it would have interest rate caps on it. Now all that's coming due. So they're running into a, a whole panoply of different problems. Their operating expenses are out of line. The market demand, particularly on apartments, which we aren't talking directly about CRE, CLOs, but a lot of the preferred financing vehicles for these, uh, for these private equity firms was through CRE, CLOs. And most of that, vast majority of that was apartment apartment loans. They, they bought those at extraordinarily skinny cap rates, and they presumed that the business plan was going to have uh, stabilized the property at the end, and then you put on permanent financing and go off to the races and do, do the next deal. None of those assumptions proved to be correct. So the reaction of a lot of those private equity groups is if they can go to their investor pool, and say, guys, we know that we've got problems over here. We're, fire we're ring fencing these problems. But right now is the time to invest. Right now you know, is the best time to invest because there's no competition. And some of, those, some of those private equity groups are able to attract new capital. And now you've got a perfect schizophrenia inside the same institution. They're dealing with yesterday's problems, and they're putting out new money. That's the best that they can hope for. And then presumably you start the, the pile over here starts, starts resolving and the pile over here you make more and more money on. There are other private equity groups that have not been successful at going back to their investor pool and saying, guys, we know that the last year was not, not a good performance, but now is the time to buy. And they are not persuading their investors. In that case, they're running into real problems because the, the, the fees that are allow them to keep the, the lights on are starting to diminish, are starting to dwindle. There are other firms out there that have such a pedigree in the market that they can, that they can put, the, um, 
the hot donut sale in their window and billions of dollars flow in. And in that case, the problems over here look minuscule as compared to the opportunities to invest. So it really, it, it's kind of all of the above with, with the private equity groups that I'm familiar with. Brian, I want to pick your brain on another topic that came out of the Atlanta panel, and that is the new bell of the ball in commercial real estate, which is data centers. You referenced a JLL report, which said that asking rents for data centers increased by 13 to 37% year over year, which is huge compared to other asset classes, and that there appears to be no ceiling for how high data center demand will reach that even power challenges are not dampening demand. So I wonder what your thoughts are on the risk of too much ebullience on data centers, concerns that they'll be functionally obsolete 20 years from now. And then lastly, a quote that data centers should be viewed not as a commercial real estate investment, but as an infrastructure investment. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Just to be clear about this, I was not the data center expert on the panel. We had a data center expert on the panel. My only point is that I, I teach markets. And anyone who's been through a few cycles, anytime you see a global commercial real estate services firm talk about, about demand with, without a ceiling, I start, I start shivering. Because we, we heard this about three years ago and, and the the investment du jour uh, three years ago, four years ago, particularly rolling into COVID, was life science. And life science, at the time, could grow because demand was without ceiling. And I remember some of the hearing about some of the loan applications where things that really were not life sciences, people would kind of tie it into life sciences. We're in the, we're in the Cambridge neighborhood along with life sciences. Therefore, there's going to be a halo effect. Uh, extending to the demand for our property as well. The only point that I was making is that anytime the market, you hear someone talking about demand without a ceiling, it's time to run. The little that I know about data center is that it obviously is very technology driven. I take the speaker's point that's more infrastructure than real estate, but the underlying collateral is real estate. And heaven forbid, if something happens to that special purpose tenant or that build to suit tenant, either with the company corporately or the technology changes, and all of a sudden you can put a data center into your pocket like we do with an iPhone. And we know that people are gunning for NVIDIA all the time right now. Any kind of a change like that is going to massively undercut the resale value on that property. And then it will turn into real estate. And it's going to be real estate that doesn't have nearly the value that you put into it as a lender. Yeah, I'm worried. Maybe I'll coin a new phrase here that you talked about the lifestyle or the life science, I should say, halo effect. I'm afraid there's the devil effect of data centers, which it's well reported now that just drives data consumption through the roof, which obviously probably rolls downhill and will push expenses higher for multifamily operators, retail operators, and so forth. And I do worry that for some of these places that take on a data center, that they become problematic for other property owners. And then the whole area becomes, quote unquote, toxic. People say it's just too expensive to operate something there. Uh, something that we keep our eye on, certainly here for this, you know, this uh, embryonic industry. You're touching on something that we, that we talked about on the speaker's call yesterday which had to do with controlling operating expenses. And I can tell you, uh, you know, I used, to, I used to be an analyst a long time ago, underwriting commercial mortgage loan requests. And all these decades later, I remember that you really drilled down on the revenue side and you spent almost no time on operating expenses. When um, I, I was actually around pre-Excel, so when Excel came along, you would just you would do the revenues and you'd have the lease rolls in place. You would know what the revenues were going to be. You would look at the lease abstract. You would figure out what the um, what the scalars were going to be, the steps in the in the leasing. You would assume a certain level of occupancy. You did all of that work on the revenue side, and then when you went down to OpEx, you would take whatever the the trailing twelve months is and grow it at two percent per annum. Boom, 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 boom. 
and forget about it. You didn't have to worry about it anymore. It was the boring part of the underwriting. And I just did a panel in um, in New York a couple of months ago where we looked at the OPEX. And I remember when I was approached to moderate the panel, I, I remember my first reaction is, oh, my God, that's so boring to talk about containing operating expenses. <laughs> But but the more the more that I understand what's going on, and everyone knows about about insurance costs, particularly if you have a coastal property, you either don't have insurance available to you, or it might be going up fifty percent per annum. A lot of localities are seeing their property tax rolls declining because of appeals on their office CBD portfolio. So guess what's happening? There's pressure to start pumping up the values and the ad valorem on all the other property types around. So you're seeing operating expenses that are out of control. And I don't think that I had ever seen until this cycle defaults that were actually precipitated primarily because of out of control operating expenses. I don't know that I've seen that before. So just like as an investor or a lender, you need to be more discriminating when you aren't in a blue sky market. When, when you're the property manager and owner of that property, you have to manage the heck out of that property. And it's more than just leasing activity. You really have to figure out how you're going to control operating expenses. So on, on all parts of the spectrum, lending, developing, borrowing, managing, the last few years have allowed us to kind of get complacent. And now we have to be active managers on all levels in order to, to succeed. So, Brian, one of the things people talk about during periods of heightened distress, this came up during the great financial crisis, are there enough commercial real estate experts, data analysts, workout specialists, uh, servicers, special servicers to handle the wave of distress that comes in? That was a concern in 2008, 2009. Is it a concern now? And, And how are the servicers and special servicers doing these days in keeping up with the uh, the growing numbers of defaults in offices, multifamily, and so forth? It's a great question. I think as a general matter, uh, the servicing industry is comporting itself very, very well. The delinquency levels and the special servicing levels are actually a little bit misleading because what it doesn't cover are all the corrected mortgage loans. From an investor perspective, it's not only important to know what what's the current level of loans in special servicing. I think the last number that I saw is pushing $52 billion in special servicing and growing rapidly and probably will continue to grow rapidly. But at the same time, it it could be considerably higher, but for the fact that these loans are actually being resolved on a pretty timely basis. There are incentives in place to try to get the loan back to the master servicer as a corrected mortgage loan. So in any given month, there might be a couple billion dollars in new deals coming in, and there might be a couple billion dollars in deals that have been resolved going back out. Capacity in the industry is always a problem. It's very, very difficult to staff up for the downturns in the market. If if real estate is a seven-year cycle, that means that for six years, you're carrying staff complement that might not be as productive as they need to be in order to make sure that they're around for your your bulge needs in year seven and eight. That's very, very difficult to staff appropriately. And I imagine you're very busy these days, right? Keeping up with everything that's going on. Tell us about that. I, I I am getting busy. When I'm retained as an expert witness, it's usually towards the tail end of a lot of discovery. And the one thing that I know about about litigation uh, that I've discovered over the decades is litigation is about as inefficient a process as you could imagine. I don't I don't generally wish it on on most people. It's something to be avoided. But when you're dealing with large numbers and more to the point large losses, this litigation is inevitable. And we're only at the beginning stages now of realized losses really starting to pop because it does take time to resolve these loans and to figure out where the where the losses are. So we've got some interesting times ahead, it sounds like, Brian. You know, I think one thing that you've done here, and I'm grateful, is you did a really great job highlighting the myriad ways that this time is different for our market. And I I think, you know, when I think about where we're headed and where we've been, 
one kind of consistent general truth is that when markets do pivot, as ours is, there are always risks and there are always opportunities. So I'm just curious about your general thoughts on on where we're headed. Are we at the bottom of the cycle? Is there more turbulence ahead? You know, what are you watching from your your catbird seat? The 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 first point that I would make. It's very interesting when Jay Powell stood in front of a microphone on September 18th and uh, in support of the Fed policy statement, dropping Fed funds by 50 basis points. I was actually at a conference in New York, and I think both lenders and borrowers believed that that would mean that reduction in overnight rates would also lead to reduction in long-term rates, that all of a sudden... You know, my 4.5% coupon that I had in my 10-year balloon mortgage loan that I closed uh, three years ago, I might be able to get that 4.5% coupon on a 10-year fixed rate again. And what's happened, the day that Jay Powell uh, made that announcement, the 10-year Treasury note was uh, closed at 368. Well, now we're at four and a quarter. So we're up 57 basis points. We're up on the 10-year more than 50 basis points. I think that there's a little bit of a delusion in the market right now that long-term rates are going to drop in order to really make refinancing opportunities much more achievable, much more accessible for uh, all the ballooning mortgage loans out there. If you have confidence in the markets and you take a look at the Treasury forward curve, there will be no point between now and year in uh, 2030, five years from now, where the 10-year T-note is going to be below where it is right now, four and a quarter percent. So I think that there's still a lot of borrowers out there that are waiting for the Treasury to rally, and then they're going to lock in on a new refinancing. I don't know that people should be holding out hope that we're going to be seeing those rates again. That's number one. But number two is is back to my to my earlier observation, which is now is a terrific time as a lender, as a lender to start looking discriminatingly at credits. If you have the opportunity, if you have the capital and you have some some level of patience, I think we've learned historically that this is the point in the cycle where good loans get made. Well, that's an interesting point there. I think, Brian, you're right. I think we're all sitting there pining away for that three and a half or three and a quarter or three and a half or 3% 10 year treasury yield. We're all keeping our fingers crossed. Um, Time will tell. We'll see. If that becomes the case, then we're talking about a real new normal for the next couple of years. The the only other quick point that I would make, and this again gets back to the world of of CMBS, but but it's more generally true. When when lenders are considering their options on fixed rate loan workouts, and we talk derisively about about extend and pretend. A lot of times, the best thing you can do is, is to extend. The worst thing you can do is t- take ownership of property, particularly something like CBD office. How is a bank going to have better leasing activity than, than you know, pick, pick your downtown property manager? Uh, they, probably, they probably won't. But it comes at a cost. The first cost, which is not necessarily all that visible, is that if you're an investor on the other side, if you're holding a three-year AAA bond, for example, uh, and you're locked in at what's now a very below market rate on your three-year CMBS bond, you aren't particularly thrilled at having that three-year piece of underwater paper convert to a five-year piece of underwater paper. That doesn't necessarily get picked up in a lot of the analyses that are that are done. The other point that I would make is that the market is different in another way, that the, that the ownership and borrower profile of a lot of commercial real estate debt is institutional in a way that we really haven't seen it in prior cycles. That means that a lot of these borrowers are strategically defaulting, which means they have the capacity to pay. They're choosing not to pay. It's another one of those shibboleths that really got turned on its head. Up, up, to, up to COVID, the best prime life insurance company quality loan was CBD office in, a, in one of the sexy six gateway cities, low leverage, backed by strong sponsorship. That was your bulletproof loan. I actually testified about that when I wanted to get capital treatment relief out of the Senate Banking Committee. 
because at the time there were no defaults, no delinquencies in any SASB deal. Fast forward, we're in a totally different world right now. These borrowers could write a check. They could pay off a lot of these SASB borrowings. But because of the non-recourse nature of the loan, they're making a strategic decision that they think they're out of the money. They don't think they're going to be in the money. And if you force them to stay in place through, through extend and pretend, they essentially turn into property managers on your property. And the problem is that they have a whole portfolio of other loans where they can build equity. So their the management attention is going to be diverted, not in favor of managing uh, your, your loan that would otherwise be an REO. And that's also a risk. So er- everything has, a, has a, a flip side to it. They get to default with dignity. There's no stigma. If you're going to hand back the keys, I think we know over time, there's really no stigma. That's one of the unintended uh, ramifications of a non-recourse market. Now, if you're, if, you're going to, if you're going to bring lender liability claims, or you're going to block access, you're going to fight receiverships, then you get a bad reputation. And certainly in the world of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they make very clear that if you mess around with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, you've essentially lost the right to approach them for another multifamily loan. That's not true in CMBS, and increasingly it's proving true not, uh, not to be the case with life company loans or commercial banks either. How would someone get a hold of you if they'd like to follow up on a conversation with you? They can get me probably most easily through carltonfields.com. And I'm also listed on the NYU Shack Institute of Real Estate faculty page. Well, thank you so much. This was a really good conversation. Thanks for joining us today. And thank you to our producer, Josh Bruning. Please join us every week as our Lightbox team shares CRE news and data in context. You can listen on any of your favorite channels and send your comments or questions to podcast at lightboxre.com. Thank you for listening and have a great week. Let's go. Yay.